o'clock, we're going to get the uh, public hearing started. Please take your seats. Good evening. Thank you, everybody, for attending public hearing on the proposed town education budget for 2014-2015 fiscal year. My name is Brad Sullivan. I chair the Board of Finance. The Vice Chair is Ona Nadel. Our regular board members are Leah Saunders, Valerie Nye, Dennis Donovan, and Tom Hollinger. The board's alternate members are Lori Santos and Bruce Farm. Our board holds regular public meetings every month on the third Monday at 7 p.m. in the Rose Room. The budget planning process began last October with a community conversation where residents were asked to share their thoughts about where Clinton Public Schools need to focus its spending. The next step is presentations by each cost center. Cost center administrators outlined where they have successfully managed to contain or reduce costs and explained why additional funding or staffing in specific areas may be needed to ensure success. The proposed education spending plan is vetted exhaustively by the Board of Education, which as you all know is comprised of elected town residents who volunteer their time to oversee our school district and its administrators. Ultimately, our bipartisan Board of Education unanimously approved a fiscally responsible budget that meets our students' needs. It was presented to the Board of Selectmen and Board of Finance at a joint meeting of the boards at the end of February and includes some increases that are required by contract and some decreases in areas where savings have been realized. As far as the town's proposed operating budget, several workshops were held, as usual, in the month of February. We examined every department's budget and received input from the selectmen First selectmen and the department heads were appropriate. All of these hearings were duly noticed and open to the public. After we did our budget review, some difficult choices were made and the budget numbers were finalized. The Board of Finance approved the following. The town budget, as proposed, is $16,065,128. The Board of Education budget, is $32,431,098 for a total proposed budget of $48,496,226. The proposed increase in overall spending is a little more than 4% from last year, and the mill rate, if these budgets are approved, would increase by less than one mill, or 8.89 mills to be exact. There is a market increase in the capital improvement budgets to ensure that infrastructure is maintained and for payment of debt service. While assembling these spending plans, the board considered estimated surpluses in multiple ways. While there are still two and a half more months left in the current fiscal year, we have attempted to project where budget line items may come in over or under budget, as well as the revenue trends to date. In the budget presented to you tonight, there is a revenue line item called appropriated surplus. This totals $150,000. This line item represents one use of our surplus to reduce the tax burden. Another use for the town surpluses or reserves was used to lower the capital budget requests in total. Finally, in various line items that, were, that we expect to realize surpluses, there have been requested budget reductions. All of these measures serve to effectively return some portion of the surplus to the taxpayer by lowering the burden for fiscal 2015 but also with a mind towards maintaining a steady credit rating and replenishing our reserves or rainy day fund. We are winding down to the budget referendum. The annual budget meeting pursuant to our town charter is May 7, 2014, which is the first Wednesday in May. The annual budget meeting per the charter adjourns to referendum by machine ballot. The re referendum this year will be on May 14th from 6 a.m. to 8 p.m. in this building. With respect to this evening's public hearing, if you would like to make a comment about the proposed budget, please come forward and put your name and address on the sign-in sheet. Please direct your comments to the proposed budgets only. Please take note that there is a reasonable time limit for any person's remarks. We're not going to have the clock going, but you know, just give everyone a chance to speak. In the interest of expediency, I reserve the right to impose a time limit, which most of you know I don't usually do. Your comments are a very important part of this process. 
and we're all here to listen to your comments about these proposed budgets. Finally, while we appreciate your attendance here tonight, please be cognizant of the fact that this board's responsibility is to propose reasonable spending plans for the operations of this municipality and its school district. This means taking into consideration the thousands of people who are not here tonight. So, we should start with the uh, Board of Education budget. If anybody wants to be heard, please come on down. My name is Phil Williams, I'm the Board of Ed, and I'd like to uh, address those comments. The purpose of having coaches is to help instruct teachers in the latest technologies and methods of teaching of the kids. We have a large amount of teachers that have been out of professional education courses in universities for a number of years, and like anybody, you need to stay current with the methodologies of making the best use of your time and producing the best team, whether it's students in the classroom or students on the basketball court. <clears throat> so hiring coaches to help these teachers do the very best job they can possibly do has been proven to be very effective. We've had them in the past, and we did a, a program where we tried them and it worked out exceptionally well. We saw a marked improvement in the way that the teachers work collaboratively with other teachers across the curriculum from science to English to uh, math and, and language. So having the teachers understand how they can work together is what these coaches function is. And that's why we're bringing them in because our job as a board of ed is to increase the quality of the students that we are graduating every year from our schools. And we're doing that. We can't continue to do it if we don't continue to teach the teachers. So that's the reason why we have got three coaches in the budget. So I hope you can understand and agree with us that these are monies that we need to spend we have no intentions of increasing staff to make a larger headcount. Trust us, HR is not what we want to deal with. Having more people is not the best thing to do. Having better people is what we want. So we're bringing in the resources that we need to have a better staff. So that's the purpose for the coaches. Well, we hire three people, that's more people. And we can stay with a headcount of exactly what we have, and you can watch the performance of the students decline over years. You can watch the performance of the teachers decline. And if you'd like to take on the issues of Common Core, then I suggest you talk to your elected uh, state representatives and your uh, congressmen and senators. If you don't like Common Core, talk to them. 
We can't do anything about that as a board. We are under the laws of the state of Connecticut, and we have to follow those laws. Some of the common core issues do increase costs. They do increase staffing requirements for the managing of these issues. We don't have anything that we can do about that. So common core is something that you need to take up with your elected officials at the state and national levels. Write to them, voice your concerns to them, if you like it, if you don't like it. But we have to follow the laws of the state. Yeah, other states have uh, declined. But I'll put your way, I'll talk to other people about that. It's unfortunate that it's going to cost us more money. Just to pass the memo to the Board of Finance, first of all, I want to thank, uh, I should have passed it down to you. Anyway, I want to say, first of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to address the Board of Finance. Uh, I recognize the effort that they and the Board of Education have put into this budget. Uh, my comments tonight are not meant as any disrespect to you or the Board of Education. That said, one of the uh, Board of Finance's first objectives is to propose a budget that voters trust, support, and pass on the first ballot. Since 2010, the board has uh, repeatedly failed in this objective. What lessons can the Board of Finance derive from these failures? <clears throat> First, the defeated education budgets did not result in any deterioration or curbing of education for Clinton students, nor did they result in any educator losing their job or not being hired. It resulted instead of large budget surpluses. Secondly, voters will not tolerate big budget increases that generate big surpluses while enrollments drop and costs per pupil needlessly soar. The state's minimum budget requirement, ratchets, this is three, ratchets up based upon the previous year's allocated operating budget and is inflated when the previous budget generates a large surplus. Many parents, number four, many parents will speak emotionally in support of almost any budget proposed by the administration, regardless of the underlying facts. And the Board of Finance members, some Board of Finance members exhibit an indelible fidelity to these highly charged sentiments by blindly rubber stamping any budget proposed by the school administration. The problem with learning from experience is the test comes first and the lesson comes later. The problem with not learning from experience is making the same mistake over and over again. Albert Einstein allegedly observed that insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting a different result. So what can, what can and should you do differently this time to get a more preferable result? Lynn Freed has suggested the time has come for a top-down budget instead of a bottom-up budget. In this case, you tell the Board of Education what you're willing to allocate to education, and they have to figure out how they will live within it. But how can you do that reasonably? The administration has finally recognized that birth rates in Clinton dropped precipitously in 2010. This is a chart. The blue line shows last year's enrollment projection. Finally, uh, they recognized that the enrollment, or that the uh, birth rates had dropped 27% in 2010. They've not recovered. The, the green line is what they is the current enrollment. Uh, so the so they've taken as you'd expect, having adopted uh, this new uh, birth rate, recognizing it, that they would actually have lowered the projected enrollment in subsequent years. The blue line again represents uh, what the enrollment was projected uh, in last year's uh, budget. The green line is what's projected this year. So instead of lowering uh, future projections, they actually they actually increase those future projections. So what has happened over the years is that as enrollments have dropped, the costs have continued to go up year after year after year, 
And as a result of that, this, this, this dotted line of the cost, the blue line, uh, is the enrollment, which is going to continue to go down at an even steeper rate. What occurs then is that the cost per pupil uh, keeps going up at a very rapid rate, and, and I think needlessly. So, what is a reasonable budget? It's a good question, I think, uh, and I, I'll try to give you a reasonable answer. The blue line on this chart represents the budgets that have been proposed in previous years. The red line represents what we ultimately pass. The green line represents, these, these are operating costs and operating budgets. The green line represents the actual costs. The difference between the green line and the red line is the budget, is the budget surplus. The difference between the green line and the blue line is what the budget surplus would have been had we passed those budgets on the first round. The currently projected surplus for the uh, Board of Education's operating budget is estimated to be $480,000. And I think it's more likely to be $300,000 higher because the non-certified pensions uh, contribution of $320,000 has already been fully funded uh, on the year-to-date basis. But using the lower number uh, projects an operating expense for the current year of $30,063,651 for the fiscal year. An increase in the actual spending of 2% which would take this green line up to here, not up to here. Um, that would uh, result in $30,664,924. Add $100,000 to that uh, for margin, to give you a margin above what you're actually going to need. And now you have a $30,764,924 budget, a 1% increase in the operating budget, uh, but a 2% increase in actual real spending. Using last year's budget as a way of deciding what this year's budget is without looking at what actual spending leads to these budget surpluses uh, that really help no one. Um, I also have a paragraph in here about the capital spending, which I'm not going to uh, go into uh, for the audience, but clearly uh, there is an opportunity to decrease that by $61,000 lower than the uh, budget that the Board of Selectmen passed. Uh, in the end, this increase in education total spending would be uh, $911,856 over the actual spending, uh, a 2% uh, or 2% in the budget um, by $431,000 or 1.4%. Uh, with the unaffordable mushrooming of cost uh, of education debt over the next two years, now would be a very good time to show the taxpayers good faith with a budget that is the right size. Thank you for your attention. I'm Debbie Hauser. Thank you very much uh, for uh, here. I have to say today, I am a private speaking as a private citizen, and uh, although I am on the board of education, happily so. Um, a couple of things about what was just said. Um, first of all, I think it's it's hard to assess the decrease in education, the quality of education, based on one or two years budgets either passing or not passing. For example, you know, education in, erodes over time. It doesn't like one day, you know, you have great education and the next day you have very poor education. What happens is, unless education is a priority, and that priority could be personal, uh, professional development, it could be, you know, budget increases, uh, it could be commitment to the children, it could be volunteers, and it could be a whole host of things. But if children are not a priority, and all the facets that include, are included in high quality education are not addressed, which include increases, necessary increases, is that you will have over time erosion of the quality of the education. So while yes, it's hard to say, okay, we cut 1% or 4% last year or the year before and see nothing really changed. It's very, very hard to quantify what changes based on a budget over a year or two. But what I'm, what I'm suggesting is that people should be very careful about having such a, 
you know, such a um, concrete example of budgets and high quality education. Um, I'd also like to talk a little bit about um, this, this repeated um, conversation about dropping enrollments. So, and the gentleman who was just up here had said that there has there is a precipitous drop of uh, enrollments, and there continues to be a precipitous, a projected pre a precipitous drop in enrollment. And I would really beg to differ. There is a relationship between economic recession and birth rates. And so, um, as you all know, the economic, the Great Recession, as it's called now, really started in 2006. So it's hard to say that Clinton is going to have a continued decline in families moving here, number one, and number two, in uh, you know people having children and those children being enrolled in our schools. So I think, again, I would caution you to think about the decline in enrollment more as being a temporary situation as a result, as a consequence of the session rather than Clinton's, you know, Clinton of the town is going, going south and it's not doing well and families are not going to be moving here. In fact, the opposite is happening. Um, families are moving into, uh, into Clinton and in fact, when the new school is uh, built, you, you're going to see a flood of new families and you're going to see enrollments going up. So that, that's my position on, on enrollments. Um, so let's talk a little bit about surplus because everybody in your family, and I know this it's very personally, we all want to live on a budget. We all want to be fiscally responsible. We all want to be fiscally responsible. We want to have a budget, we want to keep to it, but we all know in our, in our homes that we always have, I counted today, I counted this month, I had a flood in my basement um, a week ago, and I, was, and I had, I'm afraid to say, $4,000 of unexpected costs, okay? And that's not even including replacing the carpeting, and um, putting, you know, the dry, Connecticut dry basements, who's going to be another $4,000. And the reason I'm telling you that is not to tell you my personal business, but to let you know that people need a cushion. Budgets need a cushion. And I'm not saying, and I'm not sure what, what the implication is if you're suggesting that budgets are being padded, which is certainly completely false. Um, but I do think that you always want to have a bit of a cushion in case something happens that you, that you need. Um, so my, that's why I take issue with this sort of relentless attack on surplus. In fact, surpluses appear to be, to me, sort of good budgeting, um, in fact. I mean, certainly we want to have billions of dollars of surplus because that would be wasteful and that's silly. But I think that the kind of cushion that, um, that we were fortunate to have this year, and we have no guarantee which, which will happen next year, to me, is, is not necessarily a bad thing. Um, so. Um, I would also like to, can, can, uh, am I talking too long? The other thing I'd like to talk about was the, um, the issue of um, the percentage of budget, budget increase. So I don't know the exact budget increase now off the top of my head, but 2.78. So I was in the grocery store the other day and I wanted to buy some pretzel rods. And so I grabbed a box of pretzel, you know, a pack of pretzel rods, and when I grabbed them, they were so much shorter than they used to be. And I swear to God, I'm like, this is like a half a pretzel rod. This is not whole pretzel rod. And I see this in Dan and Yogurt, I see this in Nutrigamers. I know it sounds funny, but you know, you pay more and you get less for your food. And in fact, food prices have gone up 19% in 2013, okay? So yes, there is a 2.78 uh, bu proposed budget increase, but frankly, considering the overall rates of inflation, I including food, I, I would say that that, that percentage is, is respectable. Um, so I think that's all I have to say. Uh, yeah, I think I've said enough. So anyway, as you can tell, I'm in, in, um, in support of the budget. Uh, it's been an honor to be on the Board of Education. Everybody on the board, and I know everybody in this town really cares about kids. And I'm really glad that everybody's here to talk about it tonight. Hi, my name is Tatsi Kumekawa and I live on Grove Street. 
I'm in support of the education budget, but I have a couple of questions, and I hope that um, I'm one of the last people to address the education budget because I want to do two things at once, which is my want, um, and that is to address the same issue for both the town and the education budget, namely um, costs and budget for electricity and heat. And my desire is to see to what extent the budget reflects an interest in sustainable energy. Um, and because I think we as responsible citizens need to look towards other modes and sources of energy than fossil fuels. Um, I, I would love us to explore and make sure we have some funding in uh, our budgets so that we can have biofuel, solar energy, wind power, geothermal energy. Um, and so my, my question is this, is there any allowance in either budget in terms of um, the utilities for sustainable energy? And if so, I would be thrilled. cost savings to the town on an annual basis is $13,000 per school. So that's $26,000. You can't budget for that, though, Pat. You can't budget for that now. Until it's in, you cannot budget for that. And you can't not budget for that until you actually start seeing the savings. Okay? Because what happens is that's net metering. It goes back into the grid. Your utility bills are reduced. So once you see the realization of those bills, then the next year you can actually budget for that. We have seen significant savings, and Jack can attest to that. We've switched natural gas is running in every building we can, we can do that with. And we've signed a new electric contract probably a year and a half, two years ago, which has seen our, our kilowatt per kilowatt cost go down significantly. And I think both of our electric rates have gone down by 30% because of that. Okay, and we are budgeting for that. But beyond that, no. Okay? <laughs> we had one, two, you're done. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Thank you. That's right. Some people don't know that I live in town. Uh, Jack Cross, Superintendent of Schools, 6 Martin Drive. Um, I did want to just clarify a couple of statements that were made earlier, just for purposes of keeping facts straight. Um, enrollment projections have, in fact, been adjusted so they reflect uh, a, a decrease or continued decrease and updated based on most recent projections. I'm not quite sure how the perception was that we've actually increased our enrollment. Second, uh, despite the fact that um, our uh, enrollments are going down over the last three years, our cost per student has ultimately dropped from over 15,000 per student to almost 14,000, so a little over $500 a student. And lastly, um, while I you know, was okay with the fact that Mr. Carr thought we only had or $438,000 in surplus, we are actually projecting between 538 and 588 at this point. Um, to tag along with Phil's comments about the coaches, the other piece that's really important to that is that when we look at coaches as a professional development tool and an ongoing training for teachers, um, that there's cost savings for having in-house in-service programming versus sending 200 teachers out to various staff development programs over the course of the year is more cost effective and uh, tailor made for the kind of work that we're doing. Thank you. There are actually only two coaches. There are three positions. One's a guidance counselor, the other two are coaches. Sorry, 
Good evening. My name is Annalise Baziano. I'm at 37 Ben Merrill Road. I'm also uh, a new board member. And I just want to make a quick comment because I think it's really important um, to recognize the budget process and the hard work and effort that goes into it from our uh, Clinton Public School leadership team. Um, each cost center presents to the Board of Education their proposed budget. And in doing so, there is a summary in that presentation that directly, that summarizes exactly how those costs are connected to the district's goals and objectives. So by the end of the cost center's presentations, as a board member, it was very clear to me that the through line was there and that every dollar spent in Clinton on education is directly connected to student achievement and there's a common set of goals and objectives that we want for our children. It was my first time sitting through all of those presentations and I, I have to say, in the past, I didn't make much of an effort to go and I know all of you are sitting here and I know all of you weren't there because I didn't see you there. But it was really clear to me at the end of those presentations how much thought, time, effort, and consistency is applied by our leadership team when spending our, our tax dollars. And I was really impressed with that. And I have to publicly thank our leadership team for putting that time and energy in. Thank you. Okay. 